Hello, I'm William Chavis, Professor of Public International Law here at Middlesex University. And this is a lecture on jurisdiction and immunities. It's my last lecture, my last class with you uh, this uh, term. Um, we're going to talk first uh, in the first segment, the first two segments, I'm going to talk about jurisdiction, and then I'm going to proceed to talk about immunities, which are in a sense, um, they're related to jurisdiction because they really exist as, a, as an exception to immunities. So what is jurisdiction? We're all familiar with the term and we use the term in our domestic legal system as well as in the, in the international context. Um, jurisdiction is about the legal competence or the legal ability of a state to make, apply and enforce rules about persons, property and events. Um, and uh, we'll often talk about the exercise of jurisdiction. We know that jurisdiction is also a notion that applies to courts. And we'll look at a court and say, does it have jurisdiction over a matter or over a subject? But here we're talking more broadly within a state, of course, it will uh, set up a variety of courts that will have their own jurisdictional framework. Um, but the question is, is the state under international law entitled to create such things? Does, it, does international law restrict the exercise of jurisdiction by the state or does it mandate the exercise of jurisdiction by a state? We can discuss that issue uh, as well. So the, the general principle is that states have an exclusive and unlimited capacity to exercise their authority over the territory. And here I have a, a quote from the, the Permanent Court of International Justice from uh, one of its earliest decisions. It's a landmark case. If we were to make the top five judgments, if we were to list the top five or top 10 judgments uh, under international law, it would probably figure there. This is the famous Lotus case. It involved a uh, collision of two ships off the island of Mytilini or Lesbos as it's sometimes called in the Aegean Sea. One of them was flagged to France, the other was flagged to Turkey, but the crash took place in the high seas. It wasn't on the territory of any state. And uh, the result was, of course, that the uh, Turkish ship was very badly damaged and sank. And then the captain of the French ship, whose, whose vessel was also damaged, put in a port to uh, uh, get repairs for his ship, and he was arrested and charged by the by the Turkish state in France went to the Permanent Court of International Justice to challenge this and the Permanent Court decided, but by a very, very narrow vote, what we call the casting vote, where the, 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 the court itself is divided and one member of the court, the president of the court gets to, gets to rule, basically when the court is divided, that's by the casting vote. And so the casting vote uh, went in favor of Turkey and the exercise of jurisdiction. Um, but the Lotus case says that failing the existence of a permissive rule to the contrary, a state may not exercise its power in any form in the territory of another. So this wasn't a case of exercising the territory in the, the exercising jurisdiction in the territory of another, but it was, it was actually a, a recognition that Turkey in the absence of a rule prohibiting it from exercising universal jurisdiction on the high seas uh, or uh, exercising a jurisdiction because Turks were victims of the crime um, on the high seas, um, the, the court upheld Turkey's rights. So it, it shows on the one hand that sets out some principles, but it also shows that controversy that's associated with this. Obviously there are very straightforward cases and most of them, the vast majority of criminal prosecutions uh, and civil suits in all states are uh, uncontroversial in terms of the jurisdictional issues that arise, but they will arise, for example, when a crime takes place on the high seas. And they will arise when states, more than one state, is able to exercise jurisdiction. So we, we would have that case. That case would arise here in the United Kingdom, for example, when we have someone who's a citizen of another country who's involved in crime, and that person might be subject to prosecution both here and in their state of nationality. And so there you have a case arises where, where, where more than one, one criminal justice system can exercise jurisdiction. 
Um, and there, as a general rule, we're going to say that either of them can, and the one that has custody of the offender is likely to be the one that will prevail. At the civil level, it can be more complicated because, again, we often have the possibility of litigating civil uh, claims before more than, than one national jurisdiction, before more than one court. And there we have, uh, for example, we have a doctrine that's known as the doctrine of forum non convenience, which will help us to establish where uh, a civil case can proceed. And finally, we'll have rules um, in, in most legal systems, as well as at the international level, that are going to help us to determine when um, someone has already been prosecuted, when the jurisdiction has already been exercised, and it's a criminal case. Um, as a general rule, we don't want to see the person prosecuted again for the same crime somewhere else. And so the rules on this vary, and uh, there's, a, there's a whole body of international law dealing with that as well. Um, we we, we d divide jurisdictional um, uh, notions of jurisdiction into two broad types. We use these terms pre prescriptive jurisdiction and enforcement jurisdiction. So prescriptive jurisdiction is about a state's power to apply its law. So we can look at states that, you know, regardless of whether they're exercising the jurisdiction, we can say, do they have a right to make laws to govern that situation? And in some cases they will. And in some cases, they they won't, um, and that so that's the issue of prescriptive jurisdiction. And then the other is the actual ability, the enforcement jurisdiction, which is the capacity of the state to ensure that the laws are complied with. And that uh, ultimately is reduced to very practical issues if we're concerned with crimes or with criminals who are outside of the borders of our country. Um, there's a question of being able to establish prescriptive jurisdiction so that they can, they can actually be uh, prosecuted. And in many cases, that can be quite uh, difficult, if not impossible. So I'm going to talk about, I've already referred to some of them, and I'm going to talk in more detail about the broad categories of jurisdiction. And um, the, the, we will um, uh, set these out as territorial jurisdiction. That's jurisdiction over your territory, what we call personality jurisdiction. And here we make a distinction between what we call active personality and passive personality jurisdiction. Active personality is where a state exercises jurisdiction over its citizens, over its nationals, regardless of where they've committed the crime. And uh, many states do this as a matter of course. Um, it's rather uh, uh, more unusual in states of the common law tradition, and it's the exception rather than the rule here that that would be exercised. The same with passive personality. Some states exercise jurisdiction over crimes committed against their own nationals, regardless of where it's, where it's committed, regardless of where the crime is committed. And we call that passive personality jurisdiction. And then finally, we have what's called universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is when a state exercises jurisdiction over a crime, um, regardless of, in the absence, shall we say, of these other factors. In other words, the crime wasn't committed on this territory and the crime wasn't, uh, they didn't have an, a connection uh, in terms of nationality, either with the place, um, with, with the um, victim or with the perpetrator. So let's look at these uh, in more detail. First, territorial jurisdiction. So this is the basic principle of jurisdiction. This is the core of it because, and of course, states are defined by having a territory that they control. That's already been covered in earlier uh, court in earlier classes in this course. Um, so since a state is essentially territorial, you cannot have a state if it doesn't have a territory and if it doesn't control the territory. And so the basic principle here is that states exercise jurisdiction over things that happen on their territory. Um, and that, that uh, notion is um, relatively easy to establish because the territory of most countries is, is resolved or largely resolved. I don't know if this country still has any unresolved territorial issues, but it's, um, they say, I think something like 50 or 60% of countries will have some sort of territorial issues that are not 
entirely resolved. Uh, borders that for some reason or another were not in dispute, but have since become so, or where they simply were never able to agree with their neighbors on where exactly to, to draw the line. Um, territorial jurisdiction, so, so that's the, the simple way of doing it. You get out a map of the country and you check if the border is not in dispute, and then you know what the territory is. And the territory, of course, will include the land, will include the airspace above the land, and the land territory will also include um, the territorial sea of the country, the part of the sea that is deemed to be the territory of the state. That's generally up to, a, up to 12 miles from the shore. There are some exceptions that enlarge the territorial jurisdiction, um, and the classic ones are jurisdiction over ships and aircraft. And uh, so we'll talk uh, about the, the, the ship being, a, we'll talk about the flag, what the ship is flagged, and we'll say the same about the aircraft. So that a, a, something that happens on a, on a ship that's flagged to the United Kingdom or on an aircraft that, that has the flag of the United Kingdom, wherever it happens in the world, uh, will be subject to the jurisdiction of the, of the United Kingdom. Um, now, I've mentioned the issue of the determination of territorial boundaries. It's still a very live issue in some places, and there is ongoing uh, at present uh, a, a litigation before the International Criminal Court, which is based in The Hague. Um, Palestine, which is a member of the court, has referred the situation in Palestine to the International Criminal Court and asked the prosecutor to begin an investigation. And the prosecutor has then gone to a, a, a chamber of judges, of three judges saying, um, I've decided that I should proceed because I've identified crimes and I'd like to uh, deal with those crimes, but I'm not sure uh, what the territory of Palestine is. And uh, because the prosecutor has indicated that some of the prosecution may involve uh, the, the war crime of moving settlers into the territory of Palestine, um, that will involve uh, clearly uh, some precise notion of where the border is um, between Palestine and, and Israel. Of course, that border has, has not been formally determined. So the question is what, the question arises, where is the territory of Palestine? And uh, the pretrial chamber of the court has asked for submissions from various NGOs, individuals, governments, and so on. And I think there've been about 50 submissions before the, the International Criminal Court, including one that I made. I did a submission uh, addressing some of the issues relating to the border issue. You've got a little map there that was, was prepared by some Palestinians earlier this year about the shrinking scope of the state of Palestine. And it points out how, the, how Palestine, when it was originally mandated to the United Kingdom, um, by the, um, uh, at the time of the League of Nations in 1920. It had previously been part of the Ottoman Empire and the League of Nations mandated the territory that you see on the left to be man what we call Mandate Palestine. It was in, in practice a way that the League of Nations carved up uh, the defeated states in the First World War and gave their various territories to the victors uh, without calling them colonized, colonies. And so Palestine, but for all practical purposes, Palestine functioned as a British colony until 1947 when the British withdrew. Um, and so the British withdrew at the very time that Israel was starting to prepare its own existence and about to declare independence. And uh, at that time, the um, United Nations proposed a partition plan, which you see there as the, it's the second slice, 44% of the original territory. The rest was to be Israel, but um, Israel was then able to take more territory. And then subsequently in 1967, Israel occupied a lot more territory of, of, uh, of Palestine. And so the territory then in 1967 shrunk to 22%. And then this year there was a new plan proposed by Donald Trump that was going to shrink the territory of Palestine even more to 15%. So there's a real example where the determination of territorial boundaries becomes extraordinarily relevant to the issue of jurisdiction. And the reason why the International Criminal Court is dealing with this is because Palestine, under the statute of the International Criminal Court, is uh, only able to give jurisdiction over its territory. 
to the court. But the, uh, so, the, so here we have judges of the International Criminal Court who may have to make a determination about what the territory actually is. The second uh, uh, problem that can arise when we talk about uh, territorial jurisdiction is um, a, a notion that's been around for many years, but that has been gaining momentum uh, in national justice systems. And that's what we call effects jurisdiction. That's the idea that acts that take place outside of your territory, but that have an effect on your territory may in effect um, grant or authorize jurisdiction to a state. Um, and so this is, this is about things that this is territorial in nature because ultimately it still has to be established that there were effects on the territory of the state. This is going to become increasingly relevant as we have uh, criminal prosecutions and other litigation relating to the phenomenon of cyber attacks, or is it sometimes called cyber warfare? Sometimes we don't even know where the cyber attack did take place. All we will know is that it's targeted somewhere and it's the place where it has targets, where, the, where it's been targeted, that, that suffers from, from the attack. And so we need to, uh, um, we, that, the law will develop on that in the years to come as more and more states, I think, realize that they will have to assume jurisdiction in order to protect their state. Of course, one of the obstacles then um, that you can prescribe jurisdiction over your territory, but if you don't know where the person is and where the attack was launched, you're going to have a lot of difficulty ever bringing them into your jurisdiction so that they can be prosecuted. Um, and there's another manifestation of this recently at the International uh, Criminal Court again, where Venezuela has referred uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, referred the uh, conduct of the United States uh, in imposing sanctions on Venezuela or what are called unilateral coercive measures. And Venezuela has said these sanctions are designed to destroy the economy of Venezuela and to, to promote suffering among the people of Venezuela by denying them access uh, to uh, medication, to food, and so on. And all of this is having um, devastating effects on the well being of the people of Venezuela. And so, Venezuela is saying those acts, which are perpetrated entirely in the United States, are nevertheless having effects on the territory of Venezuela. And that uh, issue is currently before the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court who will have to take a decision. And if the prosecutor decides that, um, that, that, that Venezuela cannot um, uh, establish the exercise of jurisdiction by the court over its territory because, of, uh, because it rejects this doctrine of effects jurisdiction, then Venezuela would be in a position to challenge this before um, judges of the International Criminal Court. And so that, that issue is on the horizon as well. And if if on the other hand, the prosecutor decides that, um, that the court is in a position to exercise jurisdiction over the American sanctions, it's likely there'll be a challenge also either by the United States or if somebody is prosecuted by an individual defendant. Um, well, the, the main exception to territorial jurisdiction is uh, immunities. And so we have various immunities that exist that mean that, that certain crimes committed on the territory of the United Kingdom, for example, uh, cannot be prosecuted before the courts of the United Kingdom. And those are the classic ones are diplomatic uh, immunities uh, and consular immunities. Although um, there will also be immunities that are given on a case by case basis uh, to visitors to the country. Um, and also in the, in the situation, for example, of foreign military personnel, where there may be an agreement uh, with the United Kingdom that if the foreign military personnel commit crimes on the territory of the United Kingdom, that they are subject to the jurisdiction of the state um, whose uniform they wear rather than of the United Kingdom. But those are exceptions, and I'm going to return to them a little later in the lecture. Finally, and I, I've referred to personality jurisdiction, and I've mentioned these two uh, types. Um, active personality jurisdiction and passive personality jurisdiction. Um, in a country like the United Kingdom, there's relatively little exercise of active personality jurisdiction. Of course, it will be exercised with regard to British nationals uh, who would benefit from immunity in another country. So for example, a British ambassador to a country somewhere else in the world 
uh, would not be subject to the jurisdiction of the state where the ambassador is posted because of immunities, but would be subject to the jurisdiction uh, of the United Kingdom uh, here in the UK, even if the crime was com committed outside the country. And the same would of course apply to British military personnel. The British military personnel uh, who have been in Iraq or Afghanistan, some of them have been prosecuted and they've been prosecuted by British courts, um, although their crimes were committed outside, and that's because uh, they're British nationals. And um, in some countries, this has started to be expanded as well to cover not just nationals, but also permanent residents in the country. I'm not sure whether we have any such legislation in the United Kingdom about um, exercising jurisdiction over residents that happen, but some states have enacted this. I think some states have enacted it when they prosecute crimes of sex tourism. So there's a growing trend to prosecute sex tourism because you have sex tourists who get on a plane, they go off to Bangkok or somewhere, and um, or, or the Manila, the Philippines, and they, they have uh, sex with, uh, with juveniles, with children, and um, the, the laws of, of the, their countries, either of nationality or sometimes of residence, can prosecute them uh, for these crimes. And states are being encouraged in international bodies to exercise this jurisdiction, mm -hmm. because partly because of the burden that it would impose on the countries where they go uh, to prosecute such cases. Um, and then more exceptionally is passive personality jurisdiction. I've mentioned the Lotus case of the Permanent Court of International Justice. I cited it in the earlier slide here. And uh, passive personality jurisdiction is when you exercise jurisdiction because the victim is one of your nationals. And uh, some countries do this, but it, it really is more exceptional. In Lotus, of course, it was Turkey exercising jurisdiction over um, a French national for an alleged crime committed on the high seas um, and the reason was because the victim was uh, a Turkish national. 